Welcome to All Rings Considered, the definitive Tolkien podcast with your two expert, brilliant hosts. Geniuses. I'm Charlie. And I'm Pip. Today we're discussing chapter three, Three is Company. And Pip, instead of coming up with my own synopsis, I went ahead and stole a synopsis from cliffsnotes.com. I was going to read this out and plagiarize their work, so I hope you're okay with that. I am not, but go ahead. Too bad, it's happening. <laughs> so, this cha- in this chapter, Frodo has decided to leave the Shire, and he promises Gandalf that he will leave no later than Autumn, and the wizard promises to return to accompany him to Rivendell. To misdirect any pursuit, Frodo pretends to move to the country. Accompanied by Sam Gamgee, his friend and gardener, and his cousin Pippin Took, Frodo sets off walking cross-country. Along the way, they repeatedly encounter one or more frightening strangers. Large men wearing black coats and riding large black horses, whose presence instills fear in anyone who sees them. Each time, Frodo feels an almost irresistible urge to put on the ring to hide from them. One of these black riders nearly finds them hiding along the roadside, but is scared off by the arrival of a party of elves who give the hobbits shelter for the night. So, pretty good chapter. I liked it. But as is becoming, you know, sort of tradition in this podcast, I'm going to pass it over to you, Pip, because you always have all these really deep things to say about these chapters. Well, I'm just sitting here like, oh, this is nice. This I've is got pretty. stuff you won't find in the cliff notes, Charlie. Uh, so I, <laughs> I actually, I want to say about this chapter first, preface it with, for those of you who don't know, Orlando Bloom was Legolas in the Peter Jackson films. And in the uh, cast commentary, he absolutely loved that movie. Every single scene, he says, this is the greatest scene that yeah. has been ever made in the film. Just random scenes will come up, and Orlando Bloom just, his voice pipe chimes in. Not Legolas scenes, any scene. His any voice scene. His voice comes up. Th- this is brilliant. This is brilliant. Right here. I love this. So I kind of feel like I'm going to do that for each chapter. I love this chapter. And I actually think it's kind of funny because this chapter, I think, is the final resting place for a lot of bookmarks, unfortunately. Uh, I think it's the beginning of sort of the the part of the book where you will stop reading if your expectation is uh, is different. So I think if you have an idea of what high fantasy is from, let's say, like Dungeons and Dragons... I, yeah, Dungeons yeah. And Dragons player, love that game. But if that's what your idea of high fantasy is, and you get to a part of this book that's supposed to be the definitive, you know, work on you know wizards and elves, and it's a lot of walking. Yep. I think that's where a lot of people will drop off, and I think it's actually kind of a shame because I really, I think there's a lot here. Yeah, I definitely think this is where this is just one of the areas that the book gets its reputation as. All they, all they do is just walk. This is about walking. I like Honestly, though, I love I love this chapter. I'm with you. I think this is one of my favorites, actually, in the book. I love the walking stuff. And maybe this is because I am a backpacker and a hiker, and I love, I love to hike, and so it's just great to read a book where that's what they're doing. But I think there is more to it, and there's, there's more stuff going on in this chapter than it's given credit for. I've, I've got a great example, actually. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm going to start off here with an example. Stars. Stars are actually really important in this chapter. Stars classically can represent hope. You can see this in other works like, um, even like Pinocchio, right? Like, uh, when you wish upon a star, because, you know, what is a star? It's, it's a light in the darkness, right? And that did kind you, of uh, just... did you read the Cliff's Notes for Pinocchio? I did not. <laughs> I wrote it. Um, oh. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so a star is a light in the darkness, right? And so that's, that's, you know, humans have symbolized that as a representation for hope. Um, and there's kind of a neat example in this chapter where, so in the first chapter, when Bilbo leaves the Shire, Bilbo says, well, let's start then. He stepped out the front door. It was a fine night and the black sky was dotted with stars. And then Frodo, uh, when in this chapter, 17 years later, the quote is, the sky was clear and the stars were growing bright. It's going to be a fine night, he said aloud. So you have kind of this like mirroring of both of Bilbo and Frodo, 17 years separated, going out leaving the Shire and kind of be having this optimistic view. I mean, you have these stars, that's hope, right? And kind of continuing that in this chapter, when the Hobbits, the company is, is actually kind of leaving that area, not just Bag End, but leaving the area, the quote is, 
As they began to climb its first slopes, they looked back and saw the lamps in Hobbiton far off twinkling in the gentle valley of the water. Soon it disappeared in the folds of the darkened land and was followed by Bywater beside its grey pool. When the light of the last farm was far behind, peeping among the trees, Frodo turned and waved a hand in farewell. Yeah, I, I had that line underlined as well. Oh, you did? Really okay. just beautiful, beautiful line. Really beautiful. Yeah. And it's kind of neat, too, because it's it's... You have this sort of stars representing something ideal, something that you're looking towards, and you have this transition period when the hobbits are leaving the Shire from from the sort of uh, earthy, grounded in sort of present events, uh, small-scale stars that are the lights in their village, to sort of grander themes, like they're kind of walking into an area where they're looking at the big stars, you know? Uh, they're looking at bigger, uh, grander themes and entering that sort of story. I mm. think that's really nice here. Yeah. Oh, so, Charlie, if you're keeping track, and for our viewers at home, symbol watch list. Yes. Water, stars, <laughs> soon to be expanded. All right. Well, on the note, though, of just the, the beautiful lines describing scenery, that's something I think is really strong in this chapter. You get a really great sense of the Shire as a place, and it's gorgeous, and it's it's all set in fall, it says, right? So the leaves are changing, and you can just you can feel that beautiful crisp fall air we have a line here i underlined as well as the one you actually pointed out but another one too later where it says that away eastward the sun was rising red out of the mists that lay thick on the world touched with golden red the autumn trees seemed to be sailing rootless in a shadowy sea i love Charlie, that line. I, beautiful i i underlined the same very one it's uh yeah, did it's, you it's see my book i did no i read your spark notes but <laughs> Yeah, this is gorgeous. Got a list of great descriptions too. I I picked out the one that you just said, and another one I picked out. Um, I think is really nice. Let's see. The Shire had seldom seen so fair a summer, or so rich an autumn. The trees were laden with apples. Honey was dripping in the combs, and the corn was tall and full. I just kind of read this that. Is, and this feel... is getting unacceptable because I also had that underlined. <laughs> there's no way you didn't cheat on my book. I just I read that and I I just I feel very. I don't know, wholesome? I feel very, like, I feel like I, I, I understand from that line what makes the Shire a comforting place. Mm. Well, on that note, last, so last episode I talked about the the book sort of using the worldview of the Hobbit and of the Shire as sort of the worldview of, to be a, of being a child. And that this book and this story is going to sort of transition that into the worldview of adult and it's going to do that through like the develop the change from fairy tale to myth uh, as well as sort of working in or, or working against the story of the hobbit and contrasting itself with that story and we see a lot of great ways this shows up here and i think right at the beginning of the chapter you, you still have frodo expressing some doubt and he does so by casting his new quest in contrast with Bilbo's quest. And he says, For where am I to go, and by what shall I steer? What is to be my quest? Bilbo went to find a treasure, there and back again. But I go to lose one, and not return, as far as I can see. It's a wonderful little bit of contrast there. That th th This is the anti-Hobbit story that we're going to, to read here. Charlie, I knew you had something about the poem, the first poem in this chapter. Yeah, that is a poem. It's actually the same poem that Bilbo says in the first chapter, right? And it comes back here, and Frodo says this poem, The Road Goes Ever On and On, Down From the Door Where It Began. What's interesting about this little poem, though, and this is something I, I stole from Tom Shippey, and this comes from his book, J.R.R. Tolkien, Author of the Century. Really good book. Highly recommend it. Great sort of introduction, I think, to Tolkien scholarship and Tolkien academic discussion. But in that book, he talks about how in this poem, Frodo says basically the same poem that Bilbo did in chapter one, but he changes one word. And that one word comes in this line where he's, where Frodo says, pursuing it with weary feet. Whereas Bilbo had said weird. earlier, pursuing it with eager feet. And the it there refers to the road. So from eager to weary. And Shippy talks about what Frodo's doing here is is sort of a small scale version of what people do with myths, in that they take myths, stories, in this case a poem, 
modify it, tweak it slightly to fit their circumstances. And in so doing, the myth grows and changes and stays resonant with people over time. I thought this was just a great example of that because I think Tolkien is trying to get that sense of myth throughout the whole book. So for him to just do it here, this little song, uh, is a wonderful moment. And it's powerful too because Tolkien actually doesn't call attention to it. One thing I also like about this chapter, to go back to the questions of all the walking, it actually though is a really decent representation of walking and hiking. Just I can confirm it, this. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you know, I think we would know. Uh, <laughs> For those of you who don't know, Charlie and I go uh, hiking together. Yes. And uh, you, you have things here just that sort of, oh, I'm tired. I need to stop getting something to eat. And, and he does a good, really good job with those kinds of feelings. How they walk and they sort of sing as they walk. I know at least when I've been maybe walking alone, I get you, your mind kind of gets bored and you want to do things like just start singing songs. It just kind of keeps your mind occupied as you go through these things. So. I really actually enjoy those details, and I think this is a great chapter for those little songs and poems because it's appropriate. Like they, that's what you would do while you're walking. Yeah, and I think I think I'll go off what you said about um, enjoying how it's kind of a nice representation of what it feels like to be on a walking journey. I think one way that people who who really enjoy this section of the book have said before that. Or it's often said that it feels like walking through Middle Earth, and I think that's the right way to come at, you know, the next few chapters. Is instead of imagining, you know, oh, I would like a, you know, exciting battle scene, just imagine, you know, yourself walking through Middle Earth and just kind of experiencing what that's like. And I think that's that's really what people are uh, getting out of these chapters when they enjoy it. This is advice for you, Charlie. Oh, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. So okay, let's let's move on. I think you know, so we shouldn't it shouldn't go unmentioned that this is the first chapter where we see elves and we have, you know, the black rider. But I actually honestly don't have too much to say about that. Uh Charlie, do you have anything to say about Not really. I was gonna sort of point that out too, that the actual big plot points in the chapter we just spent a whole episode not talking about. But uh, there's not much to say really in analysis wise with those though, right? I mean black riders are scary. We'll talk more about that later, I guess. Those are cool. Yeah. Let's move on to favorite quote of the chapter. Yes. Charles, what you got? All right. Here's my favorite my favorite line spoken by the elf Gildor uh, that there's, they're hanging out with in the forest. And Gildor says to Frodo about the hobbits and about the Shire, the wide world is all about you. You can fence yourselves in, but you cannot forever fence it out. Love this line. So he to me, it plays on that theme I was talking about earlier, that this is about the the growth or evolution of the worldview of the child into the worldview of the adult. And saying that that, that shelter that we seek as, as children of, well, we, you know, we'll, let's fence ourselves in, let's protect ourselves, let's not be exposed to the bad things. If I, you know, if I just do the right thing, like I'll be able to avoid the bad stuff because I can, you know, build a fence around myself, right? And the reality is, you, you can't, it, it won't work in the end. Like the world will come into you. The world will come to you. And um, I think it's just a great, succinct way to put that. And I, I've always really, it's a line that's really stuck with me over the years. Yeah, I like that too. What about you, Pip? What's your favorite line? So for me, I, there are a lot of things I like about Tolkien's writing. One of them is that there are so many lines where I, after reading them, I just can't help but smile. Because I think Tolkien is very funny. And yeah. so the line in this chapter that I really like, it's really odd, but here it is. Uh, the hobbits are resting for the night. A fox passing through the wood on business of his own stopped several minutes and sniffed. Hobbits, he thought. Well, what next? I have heard of strange doings in this land, but I have seldom heard of a hobbit sleeping out on outdoors under a tree. Three of them. There's something mighty queer behind this. He was quite right, but never found any out any more about it. And I don't know, I just find that very funny, um, just the idea of this, like, this fox coming through, being very surprised, and then never learning anything else about the ring. I don't know, I think this, that makes me smile. And okay, uh, that is all we have for Three is Company. Join us next time for Chapter 4, A Shortcut to Mushrooms. <laughs>